Thank you. My name is Kia Abdo. I'm an associate professor of English here at Guilford College. I'm also the current chair of the English department. This semester, however, I'm on sabbatical. Nobody tells you that if you have small kids, like non-school-age kids, um, sabbatical means nothing. <laughs> that it's the opposite of sabbatical. I couldn't find the antonym for sabbatical. I totally Googled it, and the word, the word Guilford didn't come up as a possibility. So I think the antonym is the sound my 18-month-old makes when I won't hold her all the time. And while Stephen Salaika is enough for me to interrupt my time away from Guilford any day of the week, I'm especially excited to get out of the house. Today, Stephen Salaika will complicate and enrich for us a conversation we should be having about civility. He will problematize for us the ways in which the terms civil and uncivil have evolved historically and politically and been weaponized to silence some voices and amplify others. This should be especially relevant for us at Guilford. As a Quaker institution, our educational mission is a commitment to all things civil and useful. But what does that mean exactly? It means more than being polite. To be civil is to be deeply informed by the Quaker testimonies and Guilford's core values. Simplicity, excellence, stewardship, integrity, diversity, community, equality, and to me, above all, justice. When you're a teacher who is trying to live out justice, civility takes on a complicated life. Is the pursuit of justice, of truth, of freedom from oppression always polite? Should it be? As teachers, we struggle with how far we should push our students' comfort so that they teeter at the precipice but never fall into the abyss. But the truth is, our classrooms are, in the final analysis, a place of comfort, a room with chairs, not a raised, bullet-riddled refugee camp. Moroccan writer Hanata Banuna said something that haunts me daily. I have questioned many times what the sense of literature is within a world that suffers from so much destruction. Where there are tortures and rivers of blood, will literature have a purpose? So will my teaching be useful? And for it to be useful, will others find it sometimes uncivil? When you're a Palestinian, it's that much more complicated and that much harder. The murder, displacement, dispossession, and degradation of countless Palestinians, including the slaughter of over 2,000 from Gaza this past summer, many of them the age of Stephen's children and my own, brutalizes in a way that only a Palestinian can truly understand the mind of a Palestinian parent who is also a professor. So to quote a, a very famous literary character, was not this some excuse for incivility if I was uncivil. When I asked Max Carter about the expression civil and useful, he told me that it actually referred primarily to those subjects young Quakers would study in school to prepare themselves for useful lives and vocation. But he felt that it is applicable to us today in this very moment. Quote, if we are to prepare ourselves for understanding the realities of such a contentious subject as Israel and Palestine, we must study all the narratives and complexities, listen to the other as carefully and perhaps even more carefully than we listen to those with whom we agree and do so in a way that models the outcome we'd like to see, a just, nonviolent resolution to difficulties that are deeply rooted in memory, pain, and deep personal experience. We must do that civilly, listening carefully, setting our agendas aside, and seeking the good in the other." End quote. I have asked Sarah Minsky and Alexander Herodopoulos to more fully introduce Stephen. I first met these two remarkable young women as inseparable first-year students in 2011 in my first-year composition class. I have had them in several classes since, and this May, I will see them walk across the stage to receive their diplomas. We are so deeply honored to have you here, Stephen. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Good evening and welcome. 
welcome. Our names are Sarah Minsky and Alexander Herodopoulos, and we are members of Students for Justice in Palestine at Guilford. This summer, I interned with Jewish Voice for Peace, and I'm currently a proud member of that national organization. We are honored to introduce Professor Stephen Salaya to you all tonight. We would like to begin the evening by bringing attention to the fact that we are standing on native space. Please bear with me while I try to pronounce these names. From the Tuscarora and Sakoni communities to the east and north, the Tora, Sauda communities to the west, the Catawba to the south, the Lumbi to the southeast, and the Cherokee to the southwest. As an institution that has benefited from settler colonialism, this history is one we must wrestle with. And we are lucky enough to have conscientious and knowledgeable faculty to make this relevant in their classrooms. It is often uncomfortable for people to think of the US and Israel as colonial projects, yet this is precisely what Professor Salaita's field of study explores. Comparative indigeneity draws similarities between settler colonial projects in North America, Australia, and the Pacific region. Salaita's research highlights the parallels and relationship between the colonization of North America and Palestine. As Salaita tweeted this summer, read up on any instance of colonization for the past 500 years. The settlers sound exactly the same. Hashtag Gaza, hashtag Gaza under attack, hashtag Hamas. <coughs> Criticizing a nation state such as Israel, especially at a time of escalated violence, is not hate speech. It is not an attack on culture or religion. It is criticizing a system of neocolonialism and domination. And at the very least, it is an exercise in freedom of speech. As Salida himself has described, taking to one's Twitter account is an appeal to those with power and is demanding to be part of the conversation. Some of us may have only heard Salida's name after his tenure position was revoked by the University of Illinois at Urbana Champlain for such tweets. In the world of academia, Salida has been an esteemed scholar for years. After completing his PhD from the University of Oklahoma, Salida taught English at the University of Wisconsin, followed by a tenure position at Virginia Tech. Throughout his career, Professor Salida has published much scholarship exploring Arab American experiences pre and post 9-11, politics within the Middle East, and the role of social media in academia and activism. Furthermore, Professor Salida has authored many books, one of which entitled Anti-Arab Racism in the USA, Where It Comes From, and What It Means for Politics Today, today which received the 2007 Myers Outstanding Book Award. And here we are. Students at a liberal arts college at values dialogue who find ourselves disheartened by Urbana Champaign's decision to revoke Salida's tenure position as professor of American Indian Studies. Even at a place like Guilford, we are not immune to the false accusations of anti-Semitism that attempt to divert and distract us from talking about real issues such as the Israeli occupation and ultimately impede our educational mission. Salaita's experience and our own shows us that no matter how much respect and esteem you may build for yourself, those with power and money will go to great lengths to keep mainstream narratives dominating and those who punish and to punish those who speak truth. Professor Salaita is not the first to be ostracized by an institution of higher education, but nonetheless, it demands our attention now. Despite the diversions and the distractions, we are still here together today to listen to those who dare to dissent. And Guilford, unlike Obama Champlain, stood firm and open to Professor Salaita. We are privileged to have him here with us on this stop, on a, on, as a stop on his national tour. He has spoken at Princeton, Columbia, UC Berkeley, NYU, and many others. His upcoming stops include UNC Chapel, Chapel Hill, Duke, and Stanford. peacekeeping and dialogue during an active talk. Um, the CRRC would like to hold 
a pizza and discussion of nonviolent communication on Thursday evening for the first 15 folks who would like to sign up. Um, now if you would please help us give a warm welcome to Professor Stevens. Specifically, uh, thank Professor Abdo for all of her work setting this up. Um, I am not an easy person to work with, and that uh, I, I take weeks sometimes to answer emails, and then I answer them uh, incorrectly. And how to answer an email incorrectly? I, I guess by sending it to the wrong person. Uh, you know, so it's it's. It's, 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 it's not easy, uh, and, and, and she, she was very patient and, and generous throughout, and then uh, I, I want to also thank uh, Sarah and, and Alexandra for that, that too kind um, introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm much honored. And then the, the, the administration at, at Guilford. I, I, I very much appreciate the, 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 that they went to, that they did so much to, to to allow me to speak in such a beautiful room. I normally don't start with what I'm getting ready to say, but this is my, what I hope will be my only reference to some of the discourses that, uh, about me and my work that preceded my arrival here tonight. I am not anti-Semitic. I have never been anti-Semitic. I have never endorsed anti-Semitism. I deplore anti-Semitism. I have always deplored anti-Semitism. I have written dozens, possibly hundreds, of political essays. I've sent out, at this point, around 10,000 tweets, done a bunch of Facebook posts, I've published six books, I've given a number of, of lectures, many of which have been posted online, and I believe in the spirit of one of the purposes of higher education, that it is the responsibility of those who proffer such strong accusations to also provide strong evidence. And in that large body of work that is freely available to any human being with a computer and an internet connection, you will find plenty of forthright, unapologetic, unambiguous condemnations of anti-Semitism dating before Israel's assault on the Gaza Strip this last summer and after. What has been said to be anti-Semitic about my discourse is a conscious, willful misreading of a tweet whose intent has been purposefully misconstrued in order 
to punish me by giving me fire for my outspoken viewpoints against the Israeli state and my active role in the BDS boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. This sort of tactic is common. Palestinian scholars particularly have had to deal with it for many decades now. The most famous example, of course, is um, Edward Said, the, the late Edward Said. He was a scholar of uh, comparative literature at Columbia University and author of, of the famous book, Orientalism among other famous writings inside and beyond academe. And he was hounded for, for the last 30 years of his life. People sent uh, investigators to check out every single claim he ever made about his background in order to discredit him, and then in turn, the claims of the Palestinian people. People poured over every single word, every single footnote he had written. People, the FBI had a large file kept on, on Saeed, and I, I raise Saeed because he's the most obvious example, but just at Columbia University, Joseph Massad and Nadia Abdel Haj had extremely difficult times getting tenure, despite fantastic scholarly and pedagogical accomplishments, and they too were accused of anti-Semitism and of being unfair to Jewish students. It's happened to advocates of Palestine who aren't of our Muslim origin. It happens to advocates for Palestine who are themselves Jewish. What I'm getting, trying, asking you to recognize is that it's a particular discursive and political tactic. It's an old one. It's an unimaginative one. It's one that's easy to debunk, and it can be debunked by reading the work of whatever person happens to be under accusation in that particular moment. I invite you to do the same regarding my work and come to your own conclusions. I was asked yesterday by um, a reporter from one of the, the Greensboro papers, what, what would I say to the folks who, who don't want me to, um, to give this talk? And say, well, <sighs> I, I, I would say lots of things. Um, first, uh, talk, come out and, and listen and, and make up your own mind and ask me a difficult question if you disagree with me or make, make me answer to what you, what you feel I ought to, to answer for. That's what you do with speakers whose, whose politics you don't like. But more than that, I, I, I want people to know that it's not just me, this is it's sort of a general rule that we come into an understanding of, of people as simulations, as media inventions, basically. That doesn't necessarily tell us the story of, of who they are. Right? And I would say the, the story of, of my discourse, right? my, uh, my hatefulness and my anti-Semitism and, and, and my barbarity and my incivility and my inability to teach, comes out of a certain narrative. It's a narrative about me. It's, it's not who I am. And I, I, I urge people to, to deconstruct the narrative rather than accepting it as some sort of authentic truth. Not, not just with, with me, but with any public figure, right? Or, or, or with anybody in your life that tells you about another person that you haven't met or haven't heard from directly, right? What you're getting is, 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 is a simulation, right? Or you're getting a construction of a particular person. And I raise that point um, to further note that in order to fully understand my case, it's important to also fully understand where that, from where that narrative emerged. It emerged from the Daily Caller, first of all. If you're not familiar with The Daily Caller, it's uh, Tucker Carlson's uh, <coughs> online uh, uh, venture, his, uh, his, his news magazine, or whatever you want to call it. It's, it's a typical sort of far-right uh, site that posts a lot of hit pieces on supposed leftists, and, you know, and, and the Daily Caller ran a piece in 
sort of the third week of, of July. And again, to, to you know, kind of a boilerplate. Oh my gosh, this screaming, horrible Arab who doesn't walk but crawls on his belly, you know, is going to be teaching our pure, impressionable youth at the University of Illinois. Whatever are we going to do? He's a horrible person. A lot. That story got picked up by the Champaign Urbana News Gazette, the, the local paper surrounding the U of I community, and then it, it, it sort of took off from there. And so when I, I when people sort of raise the specter of, of anti-Semitism in my work, they're actually, whether they know it or not, responding to something precise. And what they're responding to is the precision of a particular imagery that was created based on the desires of a marginal website who had all kinds of vested interests in creating an image of, or a particular image of one of its political opponents. The tactic isn't simply common, it's also fundamentally dishonest. And if, if you can indulge me for a second, say that in the end, you know, we're, we're we're dealing with, with human beings. I try my best always to remember that of, of my political opponents, if you will, those with, with, with whom I disagree, those with whom I'm, I'm in some sort of discursive or, or philosophical conflict. Uh, this sort of stuff is hurtful. Right? We have to end up answering to charges in order to stake out a very basic humanity. And it's a hard thing to deal with when your humanity gets undermined, pulled out from, from beneath you, and you get transformed into a sort of monster whose basic decency needs to constantly be affirmed and then reaffirmed in order to be taken seriously or in order to raise a voice in the first place. Finally, that tactic, and this is where we get into the meat of things, that tactic occludes our engagement with the behavior of the Israeli nation state. So rather than focusing on, let's say, a critique of Israel, or an analysis of, of Israel, or a human rights report surrounding Israel, we descend into these discussions that revolve around invented cults of personality, right, and trying to do, trying to, uh, do a fine-tuned interpretation of a tweet to try to figure out whether that person is, is anti-Semitic or not. All the while, we have a nation-state that is continuing a decades-long process of colonization that's continuing a bevy of human rights abuses and at times war crimes ignored. We're not talking about Israel's behavior in Gaza. We're talking about the utterly silly question of whether Salaita is an anti-Semite or isn't an anti-Semite, when that question can be answered by a five-minute Google search and a fundamentally honest reading of what it was that I actually said. That's the point. We want, right, we want to protect Israel by focusing on the messengers of its absolute, and I don't use this word lightly, barbarity in Gaza last summer. We want to make sure that we reduce this decades-long process and project of colonization right, to how it makes its supporters in the United States feel uncomfortable when such criticism arises. 
That discomfort is useful and productive, and I encourage you to embrace it, confront it, grow from it. Nobody grows without discomfort. You don't grow intellectually or morally. You don't begin to understand the world in new ways if you can't come to terms with those ideas that make you feel uncomfortable. And that discomfort often pretends to be instinctive, or it feels instinctive, but it's not instinctive. What, what you understand to be instinctive discomfort with an idea that challenges something that you safely believe to be true is, in fact, an indication of a deeply held position into which you've been socialized over a very long period of your life in most likelihood. And so understand the discomfort. Understand that it's not only possible to criticize Israel and simultaneously stand against anti-Semitism, but the two actually complement one another quite well. I'm an example of that. Hundreds of thousands of people inside and outside of the United States who are adamantly opposed to both anti-Semitism and the behavior of the Israeli state are also examples of that. Here's what Israel does, because let's focus on, on what's important. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a bit player in, in all of these issues in the end. In Gaza, over the course of 51, 52 days during Operation Protective Edge, over 2,200 Palestinians were killed, approximately 519 of them were children. Some new reports just came out yesterday, or the day before yesterday, showing that around 1,100 of those killed in Gaza over a two-month period were college students. Okay? 1,100. But you think about that. Think about what, what percentage of Guilford that is. Think about them not as statistics, but as young people who, as most college students are apt to do, or apt to be, were probably idealistic, probably had great hopes and aspirations despite the misery and violence in which they lived. Some of them had probably just gotten married or were soon going to get married. Some of them probably newly, newly, new parents. These are human beings. That's why it's crucial to always look beyond the statistics and try to see whatever humanity exists in those numbers. Israel bombed hospitals. It bombed or damaged at least 43 schools. It displaced around 450,000 Palestinians from their homes into shelters run by the United Nations. And then it proceeded to bomb those UN shelters. And even though the bombing is technically over, the horror remains. It's winter in Gaza now. It can get cold in Gaza. It doesn't often snow there, but uh, you know the, the winter climate is, is not too terribly different from the winter climate here in, in Greensboro. You get 50s, 60s during the day. It can drop below freezing sometimes at, at, at night. Much of the population, and Gaza is only twice the size and landmass of Washington, D.C., by the way. It's a tiny territory into which all of these people are cramped. They're homeless. Kids are going to school without shoes, without changes of clothes. They're studying in half-destroyed buildings with bullet holes riddling the walls and the chalkboards. Illness is at an epidemic rate. Potable diseases 
are rampant. People are dying because of a lack of drinking water. People are dying from exposure. It's a type of reality that's extremely difficult for us to imagine, but try to imagine it, we must. The moment we begin to think of those inhabitants of Gaza as fully formed human beings, equal to us in humanity, just as deserving of life as we're deserving of life, as Israelis are deserving of life, as any human is deserving of life. As soon as we quit conceptualizing them as expendable human shields in the war over Islamic ideology, as soon as we quit conceptualizing them as little terrorists or terrorists in training, as long as we quit conceptualizing them as deserving of their fate because they inhabit an uncultured society, then we have to come to grips with the fact that what they have suffered and what they continue to suffer is unconscionable and very much in our purview of responsibility as human beings who are meant to care for our fellow human beings. You cannot whisk that away with phony accusations of anti-Semitism. You cannot whisk that away by professing discomfort. You cannot whisk that away by saying it's halfway across the world and I have no responsibility. The U.S. gives Israel approximately $11 million a day, which amounts to over $3 billion a year. You have responsibility. I have responsibility. All of us have the ability, should we choose, to read and learn and understand what's happening and the ways in which powerful interests are invested in making sure that we don't recognize Israel's behavior for the abomination of violence and mass slaughter that it actually is and view the situation instead as a byproduct of a savage Arab or Muslim culture. We have to do better than that, and we can do better than that. Having said that, it's long been a reality that those who don't occupy normative spaces in academe must constantly disavow themselves of all forms of hatred as an entree into public discussion. I'll try to, to give you some examples of that. Palestinians, for instance, constantly have to profess that they're not anti-Semitic, even when they've never said anything anti-Semitic in their entire lives. It's, it's a discursive rule, all right? But it's not a discursive rule because the entire world is, is, is deeply concerned with the proliferation of, of anti-Semitism. And if you are deeply concerned with the proliferation of anti-Semitism, you're not going to find it in the Palestine Solidarity community. Go looking, first of all, at a lot of the Christian Zionist communities and a lot of mainstream Jewish organizations actively court, all right? You're not going to find it there. But it shows situations of disparate power, all right? It shows that if you occupy the position of normative, a position of belonging, that you can actually articulate, at least implicitly, racist points of view without ever having to answer to them. 
Israel has uh, probably a three or four tiered legal system on the West Bank. A lot of people call it apartheid. A lot of people get uncomfortable by the term apartheid. All right. I think it's an accurate description, but I'll leave it aside. Here's what happens on the West Bank. The Palestinians have to cross checkpoints. Sometimes it takes hours, sometimes they don't get through at all. There have been Palestinian children born at checkpoints because the Israelis won't let ambulances through. Israeli settlers have their own highways. All right? They have their, their own Jewish-only communities called the settlements. All right? There's a system, a legal system, a political system, a military system in place for Jews and a completely different one in place for Arabs. All right, that's, that's the basic reality. I, I can't imagine how, even if you hate my politics, how anybody could dispute that, that basic uh, description of, of the West Bank. Well, for those who support Israel, and in so doing, implicitly support the occupation of the West Bank, I never hear them being asked to disavow themselves of anti-Arab racism. Never. All right? Never. It never even enters into the discussion. This does not tell us anything other than how power functions in the articulation of certain political positions, depending on how close those political positions adhere to the desires of the elite. The Jewish students in my class, I always like to, to, to address this. The university kept saying, well, what about the Jewish students? You know, Salaita's so going to do horrible things to them. He's going to, you know, he's going to... You know, he's going to scream at them, and, you know, he's going to make them cry, and, you know, just, just all kinds of ridiculous stuff. And first of all, I, 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 I taught for over 15 years. I've had zero complaints about my pedagogy. Zero. None. Nil. Nil. Okay, uh, I, I, I've read out of languages. Uh, sit there. All right, uh, you know, there's, there's just no, no complaints, all right? People have been working around the clock, um, you know, looking at every word I've ever written. Right? They going through my good read for you, seriously. Like I was like, okay, this is going too far, you know. Uh, I, I, I get snarky on good reads, so I'm just going to disable this account, you know. Uh, it's, it's good reads, you know. Anyway, um, Twitter's enough of a hassle, um, and 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 they 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 found nothing. All right, so that, that that's the first thing. The second thing is. How can you call me anti-Semitic when you're implying, A, that Jewish students all have the same political point of view, B, that they're incapable of disagreeing with somebody, or C, that they can't be intellectually challenged because they're too fragile, right? The, the Jewish students were a red herring, right? Just like students is a red herring very frequently in the mouths sometimes of, of upper administrators. Students is not a neutral term. So when the U of I administrators fret about student comfort, they're not talking about the Palestinian student. They're not talking about black students. They're not talking about trans students. They're not talking about queer students. I promise you they're not. They're talking about normative students. They're talking mainly about white Christian students. In this case, they were also talking about white Jewish students, and in turn, purporting to represent a demographic in its totality, right, without seemingly knowing nothing of the political complexities that exist within this particular demographic, the political heterogeneity. Students, is not neutral. I've heard so many horrible things about Palestinians and Arabs and Muslims in class when I was a student. I'm sure the Palestinian students, even in this room, probably have stories, right? I heard so many horrible things about the pathologies of black culture when I was a student. I heard so many horrible things 
about East Asians when I was a student, South Asians also, and their inherent warlike nature, uh, and their propensities for martyrdom and warfare, etc., etc., etc. And the thing is, everybody in this room knows exactly what I'm talking about. Everybody, right? Everybody. I don't care if you're a young student or you're a student 70 years ago. You know what I'm talking about because you've heard the same things. I never heard, maybe that's happened, but I've never heard an upper administrator fret about the comfort of the non-normative student. I've never heard an upper administrator say, well, what about the comfort of the Palestinian student? He has to take the Zionist professor's class, right? And the Zionist professor presumably supports apartheid. I'm just going by the logic that's been applied to me. All right, uh, what, what, what are the Palestinian students going to think, right? Aren't they going to feel uncomfortable? No. Because it's been happening to the Palestinian students ever since there have been Palestinian students in college. They do is they suck it up and they deal with it. Right? Should they have to? I don't know. I'm just saying if you're going to apply one standard to a set of pedagogical issues, that standard needs to be universal. As it is, that standard is tendentious, and that standard tells us more about how university governance is organized in the interests of the most powerful among us, and very rarely in the interests of those who need protection the most. What is academic freedom? Oh uh, boy, uh, that's a big one. Um, and there are a lot of students here, I don't want to, to patronize you. I know that you all are sophisticated intellectually and know a whole hell of a lot more than I did, probably even yesterday, right? I was going to say back when I was a student, but uh, probably last week will probably work, right? Um, I, it, <laughs> Nobody really agrees on, on, on what academic freedom means, how it performs, and what it should mean, but, but we can agree on some of its basics. If basics are that instructors and, and students, right, won't face recrimination for administrative recrimination or state recrimination from, for articulating uh, um, positions that, that others find unlikable for, for whatever reason, or for performing unorthodox research that, that maybe shapes up the status quo a little bit. And despite all of its problems, universities need academic freedom to, to function at their best. They just do. Otherwise, we're just going to simply be reproducing the status quo over and over and over again. We need to have some sort of leeway and protection to push the envelope of orthodoxy and co common knowledge. Right? That, that's how human ideas evolve and, and progress in the first place. And, you know how, how dangerous uh, you know, uh, new ideas can be sometimes, you know, Galileo, right? <laughs> uh, Jesus, right? You know, it goes back, you know, a lot, a lot of, a lot of uh, Socrates, right? A lot of people have been punished for, for, for saying things that, that, that upset the status quo, and academic freedom exists in large part to prevent people from being punished should they upset the status quo in some way or another. That, that, that's kind of its basic function. And the professors that, that, that you had, or that you currently have here at, at Guilford, well, you know, Guilford didn't just pluck them off, off the street. Right? Um, they were all subject to a very rigorous and intensive vetting process before they got here. So, some people in the audience are, are, are smiling. So I don't know, maybe somebody was plucked off the street, but uh, <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, I'd be surprised. So, that's apparently where U of I found me. They looked in the gutter. Ah, this is a lighter that looks interesting. You know, uh, but um, the, the, one of the reasons that it takes so long to hire a professor Right, uh, especially a tenured track or, or a tenured professor is, is, is because that person is going to be ensconced in the culture of the institution, presumably for quite some time, and you're not just going to be able to, to fire that person at will because, uh, because she started to annoy you. 
right? <laughs> you know, like the department meetings, right? If that were the case, like every department would have like two people. But, uh, it was, you know, there, there has to be like a really, really uh, compelling reason, there has to be due process, so forth and so on. So academic hiring is extremely rigorous. And it's, it's rigorous because committees in the plural of uh, comprised of numerous people read scholarship, they, they read um, uh, teaching dossiers, they, you know, they, they generally meet the candidate, so forth and so on. At the University of Illinois, because I came in with tenure, my uh, dossier went to outside referees, anonymous referees, I still don't know who they are, who judged whether I was worthy of a job there or not. It goes through this, this, this process because, um, because the, 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 the job that they're going to be asked to do is seen as crucial to the department's intellectual mission, right? Or it fills a particular departmental need that presumably is going to be filled for a while to come. That's why we don't want boards of directors who exist traditionally to oversee the business end, not the academic end of the university, to interject themselves in hiring and firing decisions. Very few of them come from academic backgrounds in the first place. The majority of them come from, from the, the corporate world, and they prefer to run the university as a corporation, as a Fortune 500 company, right, with, with, with all of the, the, the buzzwords that, that exist, instead of thinking about it and running it as, as a place of learning, a place of education. That's why we also don't want donors interfering in the hiring process and making decisions. Because as soon as donors confer to themselves the ability to decide who can or cannot teach, and confer to themselves the ability to decide which events get to happen in a building or not happen in a particular building, we are giving over to special interest groups, essentially, the profound independence that is necessary for useful education to occur. Nobody gets well educated when their professors are endowed right, uh, by solely by donors and and corporations who then control that professor's pedagogy, research, public statements, so forth and so on. So I'm warning you against these new systems that exist and that are growing in academe in which corporate interests and the interests of donors have a heavier hand in academic governance that play a greater role in hiring and firing and that confer to themselves the power right, to interfere even with programming decisions. This is a deep problem. Right? I'm not particularly annoyed by this problem at this moment. I've not been particularly annoyed by, by this problem over the, the past five or six months either. But I recognize in this situation a precedent being set for how campuses operate that are starting to make college look more and more like Congress. Paid to play, ideas get sold to the highest bidder. He with the money gets to call the tune. That's not the purpose or the function of education. It never was, it never will be. You're going to see an American university in profound decline if we continue to allow these sorts of interventions to occur. I don't care if your politics are to the right of the Jewish Defense League or to the left of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. You should stand against 
governing board overreach, donor influence, administrative malfeasance, simply on basic educational principle. You don't need to adhere to a particular politics to be against the way our systems of higher education are increasingly enthralled of corporate hegemony. Let me talk for a second about civility because it leads into something I know that, that some of the students have expressed a desire to, to hear me discuss, and that's um, yeah, sort of the connections between uh, the colonization of, of the US and, 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 and Palestine, the colonization of North America, I guess I should say. Um, I was very interested uh, hearing Professor Abdo talk about the word um, um, civil. And, and, and some of the ways that it's used in, in, in Quaker spiritual and, and intellectual traditions. And, and it, it's something I, I, I very much want to learn more about and continue studying. Well, civility, in the context of the University of Illinois' usage, attaches itself to very violent colonial histories. Right? It informs the dichotomy of, of the civilized versus the savage. Right? And civility, of course, exists in the domain of modernity. Right? It's part of the, uh, the ontology of the colonizer. Incivility, of course, exists right, in the realms of the native. It's a deeply troublesome word to describe the justification for firing somebody who had been hired in an American Indian Studies program. Because in American Indian Studies, right, uh, the, the term civility has, I'm not going to beat around the bush, genocidal connotation. It does, right? Uh, that's, uh, that's that's the word that was used. That's true also in South Asia. That's true also in North and Sub-Saharan Africa. That's also true in Southeast Asia. That's also true in Latin America. From the point of view of the colonized, it's not a pretty word. It has a lot of destructive behavior attached to it. Do I believe that, that the administrators did this on purpose? Like they were sitting around saying, OK, we want to, uh, you know, we, we want to make our, our justification for firing this guy as violent as possible. Civility. Okay, perfect. No, of course not. No. You know, they were thinking, okay, we're going to use this, this what seems to be a milquetoast, you know, uh, non-controversial term that everybody will understand. The reason they thought everybody will understand it is because they only understand it based on a particular connotation, right? But that's what makes the genocidal connotations of the term so troublesome. That means that these settler discourses, these colonial discourses, these discourses of violent settlement manage to reproduce themselves unconsciously. They continue to exist in our lexicon without our even being aware of it. They're self-sustaining in that sense. It's even more disturbing that they deployed the term civility in the context of American Indian studies without being able to put two and two together. My firing happening in, in AIS, American Indian Studies, um, is important. I, I don't believe this would have happened in, in you know, in, in shows how much I know about the STEM fields, I can't even think of one, right? This, this wouldn't have happened in, in, you know, mechanical engineering or, you know, biology or whatever, but even, even within humanities and social sciences fields, American Indian Studies is marginalized in distinctive ways, not only at the University of Illinois, but at a number of campuses across the country. And so when, when you sort of think about uh, the, the, uh, the consequences of the university's decision, um, I ask you to think about its consequences for the fields of American Indian and Indigenous Studies and then to the field of ethnic studies more broadly, African-American studies particularly, we see how valued these fields are 
right? These departments are in the eyes of, of the administration at U of I, and it was very easy to take this decision in relation to a department filled with people who are going to generate very little sympathy in the surrounding community when the, when, when the decision hits the news cycle. I'm going to end with Native Palestine connections to, to I hope, further illustrate uh, why American Indian Studies is important to this conversation and why a uh, type of discomfort often arises at, at, at criticism of, of Israel. And actually, I'm going to make a, decision, a, a distinction between criticism of Israel and criticism of Zionism. I, I'm, I'm a critic of Israel, yes, but I think more than that, um, to, to be even more precise, I'm a critic of Zionism. As, as uh, an ideology, or as a set of ideologies, I, I recognize that, that there are there are, are multiple perspe perspectives that are that are inscribed in, in, in the, the term and practice of, of Zionism. But I'm against Zionism basically because I oppose all iterations of ethno-nationalism. I'm profoundly opposed to Palestinian ethno-nationalism. I'm profoundly opposed to Jordanian ethno-nationalism or American ethno-nationalism or any other type of ethno-nationalism you can think of. I'm opposed to them morally and on principle, philosophically as well. And it's in that context that, that, that I oppose Zionism. I oppose it morally and philosophically because I do not believe, first of all, in the modern nation state as a site of comprehensive justice. First of all, there's always a group in the nation state that is subject to less privilege and less rights than the normative national community. But second of all, I'm against any system in which people could be conferred rights or denied rights based on nothing more than biology. Right? I, I will always stand opposed to that. And no matter what else you might call Zionism, no matter how else you might want to justify it, in the end, the notion of a nation state that must be majority Jewish, no matter what else happens, reproduces a system, at least tacitly, in which rights are conferred to different communities based on biology, right? or based on, on their identities. And this, to me, is untenable in the long term. But we see, um, we see discomfort because we often hear American politicians talking about shared values. Right? Uh, you know, America and Israel, we, we have shared values. And every time there's like a little, uh, little brouhaha between um, you know, the, the US and, and Israel, you know, the White House spokesman will get up and open our shared values. You know, they're they're uh, indivisible. You know, and, uh, it's, it, it, we, I hear a lot about shared values. You know, uh, well, I don't think those shared values are are as uh, are as uh, I guess silly as, as as the spokespeople make it sound. That they actually do share profound values. Right? They're colonial values, but they're values, right? And they are deeply shared. Right? They 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 they. When the early Puritan settlers got to the Northeast, read Cotton Mather for, for a great example, they actually conceptualized themselves, literally, as Israel in the wilderness. They saw themselves as the Hebrew tribes crossing the River Jordan and as being compelled and commanded by God, just like the Hebrew tribes of the Bible were, to slaughter the indigenous population that they encountered, and whom they called Amalek and Canaan. So very early in the project of, of North American settlement, we see how a particular Holy Land ethos influenced the discourses not only of native dispossession, but of American identity, right? particularly through the process of what came to be known as manifest destiny. We see the same thing, of course, in so many Zionist discourses, especially the early Zionist discourses of settlement. The, the, the notion that there is a predestination at play in the settlement and restoration of this land 
and that the people who already occupied the land, and from the earliest days, Zionists were aware of the Palestinian Arabs, right? And they were aware that they, that settlement either would have to stop or that they would have to be displaced. All right, this is an indisputable uh, point of fact of history at this point. Um, they treated the native community, the native Palestinian Arab community, likewise as expendable, as standing in the way of a project much grander. I'm writing a book now, sort of. By, by writing a book, I mean like I finish a paragraph like every month, but. You know, we're just going to say that that counts because that's the pace at which academics tend to work. Um, you know, and, and I did a comparison of Andrew Jackson's discourses and the discourses of, of a guy named, uh, a, a thinker I very much admire, named, uh, uh, you know, Ziev Jabotinsky. And he, he's the precursor of, of, of the Irgun militia and then uh, what became the, the Likud party. He was a Zionist hardliner of the 20s and, and, and 30s. And both of them keep saying, over and over again. Jackson, of course, in the context of, of the Indian Removal Act, and Jabotinsky, of course, in, uh, in the context of displacing Palestinians, that what we're doing isn't pretty, what we're doing is horribly unfair to the natives, and it's perfectly natural that they resist, but it's necessary. It has to happen. It has to happen for a greater dream to be achieved, for a greater nation to come into existence. And yes, the natives might suffer, and yes, the natives might end up being resentful, but in the end, the natives will forget what was done to them because they're gonna become part of us in this new grand experiment that is going to improve upon so much of what they know about the world. And this is the essence of, of, of those shared values that our destiny is manifest. I've been talking for so long, so I reckon I, I, um, I ought to wrap up. Um, thank you so much for your patience, especially for you, you folks sitting on, on the floor. I feel horribly for yammering so much. That's why I'm gonna stop now. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions and comments, of course. Thank you.